Good morning. I'm uh, Laurel Evans, a program planning lawyer with the Law Society's Continuing Legal Education Department. I'd like to welcome you here this morning to our program, Impaired and Over 80 in the 90s. I'd like to begin by taking this opportunity to thank today's uh, distinguished faculty, not, of all, uh, not all of whom are visibly present here this morning, not only for their time in speaking to you today, but also for the extensive time and effort put into preparing the materials which are in your binders. Now I'd like to take the opportunity opportunity to introduce to you the chairs of today's program, Mark Rosenberg, Murray Siegel, and Rick Libman. <clears throat> Mark Rosenberg is a partner with the uh, law firm of Greenspan, Rosenberg, and Burr, and has practiced in a criminal, uh, sorry, in criminal law at all trial and appellate courts uh, of Ontario and in the Supreme Court of Canada. In addition, uh, he is co-editor of the Weekly Criminal Bulletin, associate editor of Canadian Criminal Cases and Dominion Law Reports, and co-editor of Canadian Charter Rights Annotated. Um, Murray Siegel is the director of the Crown Law Office Criminal, Ministry of the Attorney General. Uh, his publications include Annotated Rules of Criminal Practice, Breathalyzer Law in Canada, Manual of uh, Motor Vehicle Law, the Canadian Charter of Rights, Criminal Code Driving Offenses, Motor Vehicle Reports, Journal of Motor Vehicle Law, and Annotated Highway Traffic Act. Mr. Libman uh, has, uh, sorry, is uh, holds the position of counsel, Crown Law Office Criminal in Toronto. He is the author of uh, Law of Robbery, uh, co-author of Rules of Criminal Practice, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Motor Vehicle Law, and associate of motor vehicle, sorry, associate editor of Motor Vehicle Reports. Uh, with that all said, I would like to, to uh, turn the podium over to uh, Mr. Mark uh, Rosenberg, who will get the program going. Thank you. Uh. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm just going to be very, uh, have a very few brief remarks and then we'll get going with the first panel. Um, Murray and I were just trying to remember how many times, how many years we've been doing this program and I think it's at least a decade. It's certainly as a result of the, uh, I think what really made this program take off was the uh, RIDE program which made it, especially at this time of year, very timely to uh, investigate drinking and driving. And we've always been lucky that there has always been some uh, new development just before the program. And the last time we did the, the program, it was the uh, Wills case, which had just come out, I think, the day before. This year, we've had a number of very interesting issues to discuss that, uh, throughout the day. Um, with that said, let me just introduce the first panel. You all have the uh, brief in, uh, biography, so I don't need to repeat them. Um, on the my far right is Philip Perlmutter who uh, you don't you don't have his biography he didn't send it in on time so I'll just <laughs> <laughs> so so I'll just uh, I'm sure most of you know um, know Philip Philip was called to the bar in 1981 practiced uh, as duty counsel and then in private practice for a total of 10 years and then in March 1991 joined the Crown's office and is an assistant Crown in Etobicoke and as you know, Etobicoke is probably the busiest jurisdiction in terms of drinking and driving because of the uh, number of highways that all surround that jurisdiction. And uh, so we're very happy to have Philip with us. Beside Philip is Catherine Cooper, who is counsel with the Crown Law Office. And she is one of the people, along with Rick Libman and some others, who have been arguing these breathalyzer cases in the Court of Appeal. Um, our chair today for this panel on recent charter developments is Judge uh, Ian McDonnell um, of the Ontario Court Provincial Division who sits here downtown, mostly downtown at uh, Old City Hall. And finally, to my immediate right is Murray Siegel who is the uh, director of the Crown Law Office and um, has been for many, many years involved in this program and editing probably the most important book on uh, drinking and driving and breathalyzer cases. So with that, uh, perhaps we'll start, uh, Ian. Thank you, Mark. There's uh, probably no area of the criminal law uh, in which the protection of individual rights and the community's interest in law enforcement seems to chafe against each other so much as in the area of drinking drivers. Uh, over the years, the friction between the two uh, has spawned a 
seemingly endless series of uh, charter issues, and there always uh, seem to be, as Marcus pointed out, several which are hot at any particular time. Uh, this morning, we are going to touch on a few of them. Uh, there is no way that we're going to be able to touch on all of them. And I think uh, that there's a greater discussion of them in the materials which have been uh, prepared. For the purposes of the, of, of the first few issues, uh, we've decided to, to assume a, a particular set of facts that uh, may help to focus our discussion. Assume that all the events occurred on, on March the 1st, 1993, and that the facts are as follows. The accused was stopped for speeding. In the course of requesting the accused driving documents, the officer noticed the odor of an alcoholic beverage coming from inside the car. There were no other indicia of drinking and nothing to indicate impairment. The officer asked the accused a series of questions and the accused told him that he had had two beers within the previous hour. The officer made a demand for a screening sample and produced a J3A. The accused registered a fail. Because of that reading, the officer believed that the accused was over 80 and arrested him for that offense. After advising the accused of his right to counsel and making a breathalyzer demand, the accused was transported to the police station for breathalyzer. In that situation, the officer believed that he had reasonable and probable grounds to arrest the accused and to make a breathalyzer demand. Was he right? This, um, this fact situation obviously raises the, the problem of the alert uh, J3A and um, uh, what are we to do with these cases that are in the system. Um, just as an introduction, I think what's most interesting about the whole J3A issue uh, is that um, reminds us to have a really a healthy skepticism about some of these electronic devices. I think we get used to the fact that because our kids play Nintendo and seem so good at it that these devices are uh, really uh, work. And um, the controversy around the alert device has really, I think, brought, drawn everyone's attention the fact that we really have to be careful. Um, if I could just ask you to go to my paper, which is page A-59. Um, the, um, and because there's an error in the first line, what I've said is in December 1992, the government recalled the alert. That's wrong. It should say in April 22nd, or on April 22nd, 1993 the Ontario government recalled the alert. And so in the fact situation, what we're talking about is a case where the police officer was using the alert J3A device um, prior to its recall. Now, the, in de deciding whether or not we've got an issue here as to whether uh, or not the breathalyzer results should be admissible and the preliminary issue, did the officer have reasonable probable grounds to make the breathalyzer demand, I think the, the chronology is important, and you'll see it referred to in several places in the, uh, in the various papers that are in the uh, material. Um, for me, I guess there are a couple of important dates, and you might just want to keep them in mind as we go through this issue. Um, it looks like since about 1990, the people in the know have been concerned about the J3A and as to whether or not it is... Um, as reliable as it should be. It's an approved device, but there is something called the Alcohol Test Committee, which are several scientists who advise the federal government as to what devices should be approved. And it looks like there has been, since 1990, some concern. Probably that's about as high as you could put it, until August of 1992. So that's the, to me, that's the key date, August 1992 the committee actually starts to warn the federal government that there's a problem um, because they become aware of, of some plastic insert. Now, I don't know how these things uh, work exactly, but all you need to know is that there's a plastic insert in the J3A which it looks like may affect the validity of the, of the test results. And 
what the committee and uh, modified by having this plastic insert put in them should be withdrawn um, until can be determined whether and put back to what they to what they used to be um, and what they also recommend in August of 1992, according to the material I've seen, is that the use of the alert J3A should be suspended. Now, what's interesting, of course, is this is August 1992, and as I opened up, or as I said in my opening remark, April 1993 is when the device is actually withdrawn. Um, the actual withdrawal occurs because of a recommendation in March of 1993, so a further recommendation when the Alcohol Test Committee becomes aware of even more modifications. And I guess as a result of this general unease, there is now a concern by March of 1993 that this thing, which the police officer has in his car, his or her car, may not be uh, an approved device anymore because of all the modifications. And then, as I say, April 22, 1993, the device is withdrawn. How does that all fit in with the hypothetical of a, of a police officer who's just doing his duty and stops the, uh, the uh, motorist in March 1993? The key, I guess, is that um, because the officer, um, the officer relies upon the fail on the alert as giving him reasonable and probable grounds to believe that the accused has committed the over 80 offense and therefore that he can make the breathalyzer demand. Um, the key is that the officer has to have subjective and objective grounds for that belief. In other words, it's not sufficient that he personally, in his own world, uh, believes that uh, uh, he has reasonable probable grounds. Now, if he didn't know about the problem with the alert devices, notwithstanding that this has been percolating for a couple of years and really is starting to caused some concern by August of 1992, he has the requisite subjective belief. There's no doubt about it. He believes that uh, he can rely upon the device. Um, I'm troubled whether or not he has reasonable grounds in the sense of an objective belief. And I guess what really troubles me, is it open to the government to shield, in effect, shield the police officer from having uh, the knowledge that it seems to be widespread in the scientific community that this device may not in fact be reliable. And can it be said to the officer that it's reasonable um, to rely upon the results in light of the uh, knowledge which may exist in the scientific community and may also exist in the higher echelons within the police force? Uh, and the, um, I, it seems to me that um, uh, the question you really have to ask is um, what information uh, did the um, hierarchy within the police force have and were they under a duty to disclose that to the rest of the, the sort of the online, the line officers who are administering this test? And I'm also concerned that I would think that the people, the, the breathalyzer technicians probably must have had some concern or must have had some knowledge if they're having any kind of contact with the Center of Forensic Sciences and how much of this knowledge has percolated throughout the ranks. Uh, so I guess if, if you're doing one of these cases, what you have to try and figure out is from cross-examining the police officer, what did he know, uh, what did he suspect? Uh, because if he suspected that there was a concern, I don't think that he can simply proceed on as if, uh, in a sense, with willful blindness, with uh, I don't want to make any inquiries because I'm going to find out the device is not reliable. If, in fact, um, he knew or had reason to suspect the device was unreliable, then in my view, he did not have reasonable and probable grounds. Um, the alternative approach is, even if you assume he had reasonable and probable grounds, um, the alternative approach is the one that I've set out on page A64. Uh, A-64. The demand under section 254 sub 2, the, the alert demand, the roadside or the approved screening device demand, must be a demand to provide a breath sample into an approved device. And if, in fact, this particular device, because of the unauthorized modifications, is not 
no longer an approved device, then the demand is invalid. If the demand is invalid, or at least arguably invalid, because it was not a demand to provide a sample into an approved device, then you have an illegal and therefore unreasonable seizure. You there have a therefore have a violation of Section 8 of the Charter, because taking breath samples is a seizure. Um, it's done illegally because it's no longer authorized by law. Um, the results of that test, the fail, have to be excluded from the officer's calculus as to whether or not he or she had reasonable and probable grounds. You just take that out. And uh, the, if you want the authority for that, if you look at footnote 19 on page 65, the reference to the plant case, where what the Supreme Court of Canada has said is if you have an unreasonable search or seizure uh, that preceded a lawful search or seizure or another search and seizure, you just take out that unlawfully uh, obtained information out of the calculus and then you look at what remains to see if there's sufficient reasonable probable grounds. And in, in the fact situation we've been given, it's likely that without the fail, the officer would not have had reasonable and probable grounds. Okay. Thanks, Mark. <coughs> Kathy, in the fact situation that uh, I described at the beginning, it would appear that the officer obtained at least part of the grounds for the screening demand by questioning the accused at roadside about whether or not he'd been uh, drinking that night. Uh, in practice, that seems to be a fairly common investigative technique. Is there any charter issue raised by it? Well, I think uh, Section 10B is the uh, obvious um, charter ground that, that comes to mind here. Um, we do know, have known for a while, that from cases like CO and Thompson and Saunders that uh, a screening device demand and request for physical sobriety tests at the roadside can be made without um, the police informing the detainee of their Section 10B rights. Um, that is because of the provision in the Highway Traffic Act, now Section 48, that gives the police the power to stop motorists for the purpose of determining whether there's evidence to make a demand under Section 254 of the Criminal Code. Earlier this year, in June, the Court of Appeal in a um, case uh, called R versus Hishon, uh, applied the same principles and reasoning to the matter of questioning by the police officer of the detainee at the roadside about the detainee's alcohol consumption. Uh, that um, was decided by a very brief endorsement. I've set it out in full in my paper at page, uh, it's dealt with at pages eight and nine. Um, so it's, it's not likely going to um, appear in the CCCs. I don't know whether the MVRs would pick that up, but, uh, but it does apply the reasoning of Saunders to that situation. In Hishon, the officer, um, after questioning the accused about his alcohol consumption and having observed his erratic driving, made a breathalyzer demand directly. Um, in this fact scenario we have here, a screening device demand was first made, but I think the, uh, that would have been similarly authorized. Uh, it, I should note that, of course, if the Crown uh, wishes to actually adduce the detainee's responses to that questioning into evidence, then, of course, voluntariness will have to be established either by voir dire or by admission. But I would think in most cases it wouldn't be necessary for the Crown to actually um, adduce that, those responses. Uh, if, uh, given the, the brief nature of the endorsement, if anybody does uh, desire an actual copy of it, uh, feel free to call me at, at the Crown Law Office or Rick Libman, he argued the case. Murray, uh, for the sake of argument, uh, let's assume that uh, Mark uh, persuades the court that there were no reasonable and probable grounds to believe that uh, the accused was over 80 and uh, therefore no grounds to make uh, the breathalyzer demand. If the accused complies with the demand and provides the samples, are the results admissible? Uh, Ian, uh, the question um, squarely raises the continued uh, applicability of 
Rilling and the Queen in 1976 uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. The issue is, uh, is uh, very well presented in, in Mark's uh, paper, specifically at page, uh, pages A67 and following. And you might uh, recall that uh, Rilling indicates or holds that uh, while absence of reasonable probable grounds uh, may provide uh, 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 a, a defense to, uh, to refusing a breathalyzer demand, if there is compliance, the certificate uh, uh, will be held to be admissible. It's, uh, uh, the, ra the rationale there is uh, based on uh, uh, pre-charter uh, pre -charter holdings uh, as embodied in, in Ray and the Queen. Um, and um, the issue continues to be dealt with uh, uh, subsequent uh, to the Charter, and in Ontario uh, it has not been resolved by the Court of Appeal, notwithstanding efforts by, uh, by uh, in a number of cases, by uh, counsel to seek clarification. The Court of Appeal has uh, effectively and probably wisely ducked the issue. Um, it, um, the, the sort of the technical background behind this is that uh, uh, there's no, uh, as Mark discusses, there's no requirement on the Crown to prove reasonable and probable grounds in order to have the certificate admitted uh, or to rely on the presumption under Section 258.1c uh, or G, uh, because those paragraphs are cast in terms of a demand made um, pursuant to Section 254.3 uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, one just has to show that that's what the officer was effectively operating under, as opposed to proving um, that uh, all the elements that are incorporated by Section 254.3 itself. And the courts uh, seem uh, uh, seem uh, reluctant to, uh, uh, at first blush, to deal with uh, Rilling uh, because of that uh, that uh, technical uh, aspect in 258.1c and g. And as well, I guess simplistically put, until the Supreme Court of Canada overrules Rilling, Rilling is the law. Um, and I think it's sort of fairly important uh, to make a distinction between um, between uh, charter, the charter, uh, and and uh, and uh, the era pre-charter uh, in which Rilling arose. Uh, one thing is clear: if if you don't rely on the charter uh, as a defense counsel. Uh, there's no question that Rilling will be a, a complete answer in my view. Um, the, therefore, it's significant for defense counsel to, uh, to uh, it's, 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 it's obligatory to rely on the charter. Um, the, uh, the courts have shown a willingness uh, to re-examine uh, pre-charter cases uh, uh, in the context of the charter, and we have a, a, an excellent example in, in, uh, that's canvassed in the material in Mark's paper in terms of uh, Terrans looking at Chromiac under 10b, um, the same concept of detention but with a different result. Uh, what one sees in, uh, in courts quite often is that, uh, is that uh, counsel um, uh, do not invoke the charter, which gets them into trouble, and secondly, uh, they quite often um, raise the fact that there is a breach, a breach under Section 8, and go no further. The breach under Section 8 may relate to, uh, to uh, def the deficiency in making the alert uh, demand uh, and or a deficiency in making the breathalyzer demand as a result of uh, what, what has preceded it. For example, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the alert machine itself being in question. Um, the, uh, what has to happen, uh, in, in my view, is that defense counsel has to go on and make an argument under 24-2 and address the real issues, and the real issues would be the three-pronged test in Collins and the Queen, and probably the issue will come down to a question of uh, good faith in the context of the, of the alert machine. Some of the questions that Mark, uh, Mark uh, touched on uh, in his response, uh, did the officer know, did the officer suspect, can the officer be, be clothed or cloaked uh, with uh, state knowledge? And um, an interesting decision in that respect is the recent case of Speller uh, by Judge Lamkin. And, uh, 
uh, where uh, he recognizes uh, a, uh, a distinction between sort of a, 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 an ordinary drinking and driving case and a much more serious uh, form of drinking and driving where there may be injury or accident and uh, the consequences uh, in those case, cases. Um, that would, uh, I guess, be my response here. Thanks, Marie. Uh, Mark, from a defense counsel's point of view, what's the, the position with respect to the applicability of, of Rilling? Well, the, um, the problem, I think, uh, I'll just be very brief. The problem, as Murray has outlined it, is, is quite true. Rilling is the law in the, in the common law non-charter uh, territory. And so the problem is that if you suspect that you have um, an issue as to whether or not the officer had reasonable and probable grounds to make the breathalyzer demand, um, in light of Rilling, you have to do it in the charter context, which means, I guess, as a matter of caution, uh, you have to give notice of some kind to the, uh, to the Crown that you intend to rely upon the charter under Section 8. Otherwise, uh, court of, our Court of Appeal has consistently said that Rilling is a law. The Crown does not have to prove reasonable and probable grounds, and the lack of reasonable and probable grounds is neither here nor there. That's simply uh, an application of the old Ray case. Evidence, no matter how obtained, is admissible. Um, with the charter, of course, it's a whole new ba um, ball game. Uh, eventually, the Court of Appeal will have to say, as they have, in my view, have already said, but um, will have to say that if there's a charter violation as a result of lack of reasonable and probable grounds, then obviously the common law doesn't apply. Section 24.2 of the charter applies. And Rilling, like Ray, Rilling will have to go the way of Ray, which is it just doesn't apply in the charter <coughs> context. Now, the, the difficulty is that we have general division judges going both ways on this issue. Um, sometimes an obiter, sometimes not, and uh, because most of these cases are resolved at the summary conviction appeal court level, uh, we haven't got a clear direction. In my view, the Court of Appeal has already spoken on the issue. Now, no one agrees with me <laughs> <laughs> at this table, except Judge McDonnell, I'm sure. Um, page A-71. Um, I refer to a case called Wasson, W-A-S-O-N, which Judge McDonnell lost, lost um, when he was counsel with the Crown Law Office. And I've set out the, um, the excerpt from the case. In my view, that even though they didn't mention Rilling, that is a, dis that is a decision that says if you've got a violation of Section 8, you, you look to 24.2, you don't look to the common law. It just makes perfectly good sense. Uh, if the Court of Appeal, as I said, if the Court of Appeal was, as they say, per incurium and not referring to Rilling, and I can't imagine Judge McDonnell did not refer them to it, but if they were per incurium, too bad. That's for them to deal with. The lower courts are bound, even if it is per incurium. And um, for that proposition, I've, if you look at footnote 39, that um, uh, deals with those stare decisis point. So, in summary, my simple message is it is a charter issue, so you cannot play around, pretend it's not a charter issue. You have to deal with it as a charter issue, which means you're into Section 8, which means you're into 24.2, which means you're into the Collins test, which we're going to talk about later on. And for whatever it's worth, the Rilling was uh, before the court in Wasson, uh, although it didn't quite make it into the, into the reasons for judgment. Uh, Philip, uh, the last question on the in, on this first area, most judges know that the J3A was was withdrawn, and and uh, and when it was withdrawn, but they have little reliable evidence or, or knowledge beyond that with respect to what the problem was. If a charter issue is raised uh, concerning the reliability of the J3A, who has the burden of producing the the evidence with respect to the matter? The defense is the short answer, of course, but. Um, I think, I think it has to be considered in two contexts. One is in the trial context, and the other is in a summary conviction appeal context. Uh, I think it's fair to say that certainly now, and perhaps arguably with cases prior to April 22nd, uh, the Crown may or may not be able to prove that a particular J3A was approved, although I think as a matter of law, it's generally not necessary for them to prove that. Uh, my position would be a trial that certainly the defense has to call some evidence uh, beyond. First of all, it would be nice if the defense provided some notice, but uh, quite apart from that, it would be nice if they called some evidence. 
and uh, beyond those interdepartmental memos that are being photocopied at a furious pace. Uh, my position would be certainly on pre-April 22nd cases that they ought to uh, provide affidavits. There are a number of them certainly in Metropolitan Toronto floating around, one from Jeff Patrick from the Metropolitan Toronto Police Force who's got a, quite a uh, detailed knowledge of what's been installed where in the J3As and what it may or may not mean. Uh, but I, I'd suggest that it may depend upon the jurisdiction because I wouldn't be at all surprised if there are certain jurisdictions outside of Metro where there's someone who can actually say whether or not the particular three J3As that that police force has have ever been modified. And certainly if they haven't been, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be of assistance. And, and, I, and I suppose my question is why presume they have been modified? Uh, I'm not sure the threshold is very high. I think I'd have to concede that if the defense raises it, and they could possibly, I can think of a number of ways they might be able to raise it, perhaps through the officer themselves. The officer may have some knowledge about what's happened to that J3A. Once it's raised with some air of reality, it may fall upon the Crown to respond, and that's part of the reason that notice would be helpful in advance, because if it's going to be an issue, someone, it may well be the Crown will consult and find out, responsible Crown will find out that indeed it's been modified 16 different ways and they're going to concede the issue, at least in terms of uh, a, a breach. I, in the, the appeal context, I checked last week, and it's certainly in Metropolitan Toronto, there are not as yet any summary conviction rulings arising from cases where the J3A issue was argued at trial, uh, as opposed to where it was argued on appeal for the first time. There, uh, the Crown position, as I understand it, on appeals is that if it's a, where it wasn't argued at trial, if it's going to be raised on appeal, it has to be done in the normal fashion for raising a uh, fresh evidence application. There are three cases that I've been briefly made aware of. Uh, one is a case called uh, Kazmarek, K-A-Z-M-A-R-E-K. -E you can write it down, but there's no ruling at it. It's on reserve with Justice Hayes. In that case, a fresh evidence application was made and affidavits were filed by uh, Mr. Wigmore of the Center of Forensic Science and Jeff Patrick. And I understand the Crown uh, was able to cross-examine them on their affidavits and that's pending. Uh, Judge German, I'm told, I don't have the case names, on two occasions uh, fresh evidence was argued in front of her based on these interdepartmental memos or something of that sort. And she didn't agree with the Crown that, that they weren't sufficient. But having ruled they were sufficient, she apparently found them irrelevant because they were both, they were both refusal cases. And uh, I un as I understand it, in those cases, the trial judge properly found on the evidence that the accused had been faking, so it really didn't matter what kind of machine he was blowing into. So I suppose uh, the, my position is that uh, it would be a trial that give us am abundant notice and not these generic, these generic notices that we're arguing every section but three of the charter and give us some clue as to what it is the breach under Section 8 might be. And, and finally, I just wanted to tell, remind Mark that Wayson was a dangerous driving case and that may have some influence on how you might use that decision, and I want to thank him for what I know will be a uh, wealth of uh, charter applications that I'm going to be receiving in the next two weeks. <laughs> That's how the Crown distinguishes cases. It's a dangerous driver. <laughs> as long as it works. Now for the next part of the discussion, uh, I'm going to advance the facts a little bit and assume that, uh, that after arrest, the accused was advised of his right to counsel in standard Ontario Post Bridges manner. He was taken to the station and placed in the report room with an officer to await the arrival of the breath technician. While waiting, the officer reread from the back of his memo book the standard advice with respect to right to counsel. The accused said that he understood. The officer then pointed to a phone on the desk at which the officer was sitting and asked, do you wish to call a lawyer now? The accused hesitated and then said no. On a charter application at trial, the accused testifies that he did not call his lawyer because he thought he would have to do so in the presence of the officer. The officer testifies that if the accused had said that he wanted to call counsel, he would have left the room to permit the accused privacy. Kathy, the accused alleges that his right to counsel was infringed in that scenario. Is there any merit to this submission? 
Uh, well, yes, there, there is merit, and that has been uh, affirmed recently by the Court of Appeal. In, uh, on October 25th of this year, they released a judgment in the case of Regina versus Jackson, where that very issue was raised. It's a full judgment, and it will uh, no doubt be ultimately reported. But it, in that case, the facts were quite similar to those presented here, and the court held that notwithstanding that the accused did not actually indicate any concern on his part about privacy, that is at the time, to the officer, and notwithstanding that privacy would have been in fact provided had the accused indicated he wished to call his lawyer, the um, court held that if the surrounding circumstances may reasonably cause the accused to anticipate that he will not be able to speak to his lawyer in private, and if it's reasonable to expect that the, the officer to anticipate that effect on the accused, then the officer will be required to uh, inform the accused that he or she has the right to retain and instruct counsel in privacy, and failure to do so will constitute a Section 10B infringement. As I've indicated, the um, the factual circumstances in that case were quite similar to those presented here. There was a phone uh, sitting on the desk and the phone book and the, the officer pointed to that. He was seated behind the desk and made no um, move to, um, to get up and leave the room and it w the accused testified that he, he thought that the officer would have been sitting there the whole time during his conversation with his lawyer. And uh, the Court of Appeal were, felt that there was a 10B infringement in that case. I should note that in Obiter, the court rejected making such an instruction about privacy one that would be required as a matter of course, so it will depend on the surrounding physical circumstances at the time that the 10B rights are given. But uh, where this is all going to, uh, whether it's going to make a lot of difference at the end of the day, um, it, it may not because of the court's Section 24.2 analysis in that case, and Judge McDonnell will be dealing with that uh, in a moment. Um, I should also say that uh, as for the officer's ins instructions um, and whether or not they complied with bridges, that is, with respect to the availability of free and immediate legal advice, that, of course, has been settled in Ontario by the... Uh, uh, sextet of cases from the Court of Appeal, Regina versus Baldwin, Baldwin and five others, but I would note that leave to appeal has been granted by the Supreme Court of Canada in a couple of those cases, as well as in several from other provinces, so uh, uh, it may be that that uh, situation will change once again. Thank you, Kathy. Mark, the focus in, in Jackson was the issue of, of privacy, but does the reasoning of the Court of Appeal have implications for other right to counsel issues beyond privacy? Well, I think that um, Jackson, I think, is going to turn out to be a pretty important case, um, not only for the, uh, the issue that we're dealing with now, but the 24-2 issue that we're going to deal with later. Um, one of the difficulties, though, within the right to counsel era, um, area has always been this problem that the police officer will take the view that, um, uh, or his or her testimony will uh, essentially be uh, I gave him his rights, I asked him if he wanted uh, to uh, call a lawyer, he said no, there was nothing, he didn't say anything or do anything to indicate that he didn't understand his rights, boom, that's the end of it. The accused will get up in the stand and say, uh, you know, I didn't know that I could call a lawyer immediately, or I didn't know that I could call a lawyer in private, or I didn't know how to get access to legal aid. And the difficulty has always been reconciling those two um, uh, pieces of evidence, if you like, because you have to show a violation, and how can there be a violation by the police if they didn't know what was in the accused's mind? So I think the importance of Jackson is they've probably given us a test, and so you want to look at the case. The test, it seems to me, is was there something in the circumstances, um, and, and so that's not necessarily something that the accused did or didn't do, but something in the circumstances to make it reasonably apparent to the officer that the accused did not understand his rights in whatever particular as uh, aspect of it, whether it's privacy, legal aid, um, immediate access, or whatever. So it's what I call the reasonable appearance test, and it's an attempt to reconcile that. 
How do you get there? I think you have to cross-examine the police officer and try to get out the kind of information that came out in Jackson that they were sitting across from the same desk and he pointed to the same to the phone and he didn't make any move the officer didn't make any move to, to leave. I think it was important to Jackson as well that the accused was also able to testify about his subjective belief and from that the court was able to infer well it was reasonably apparent to a reasonable police officer that this person may not have understood his rights. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we can move uh, to the third topic uh, that we're going to discuss and assume a different uh, set of facts uh, for this. Assume that we have an accused who was involved in a head-on collision uh, while proceeding westbound in the eastbound lanes of Highway 401. When the police arrive on scene, the accused is conscious but in great pain. After she is extricated from her vehicle, she is rushed to the hospital by ambulance personnel. The police follow behind the ambulance, intending to interview the accused about the accident. She is taken into a trauma room, and the police wait outside. For valid medical reasons, the attending physician requires a blood sample, and she obtains the accused's consent to take blood for diagnostic and treatment purposes. The blood's analyzed by the hospital, and uh, the accused is over the legal limit. The doctor decides on her own to advise the waiting officers that the sample was taken and of the results of the analysis. Philip, can the police get the evidence? Well, they'll always get the evidence, but whether they'll get it in is another question. There's a recent decision from uh, the Supreme Court of Canada from October 21st uh, called Dirsch. And in Dirsch, basically, the, uh, there was an accident. The accused was taken to the hospital. The accused refused to provide blood to anybody, the doctors or the police. The police waited, the doctors waited till he was unconscious and took the blood for medical purposes. They then sent a written request to the, the police sent a written request to the doctors for the information and got a written reply, all the information they needed. So they went and got a warrant and seized the blood. The uh, Supreme Court of Canada took a dim view of this, uh, but I'd suggest on our fact scenario, it's a little bit different. There are two ways the police might get the evidence and get it, in, uh, get it admitted. One is in terms of obtaining a warrant. I think in Dersh it was the fact that there were several factors. There was the unequivocal refusal by the accused. There was the improper, clearly improper conduct by the police in taking the sample and then disseminating the information. And there was the police uh, uh, taking advantage of the court hold, held of the improper conduct of the doctors and relying on that to get the warrant. It was all of those factors together coupled with the concern about information flowing freely between police and doctors that led to a 24-2 exclusion. Uh, I think our scenario is somewhat different. I think arguably there was consent, at least for the taking of the blood for medical purposes, that the police did not initiate the contact in terms of getting the information it was fortuitously received. So, and there was also some evidence of impairment uh, driving westbound in the eastbound lane that might assist them, uh, although in Metro that's fairly common, of course. <laughs> but. I would, I'd suggest that they could possibly, they arguably it might be distinguishable from Dirsch. The second manner in which they may do it, and I think the safer way, is using uh, the basis of uh, Regina and Redmond from our Court of Appeal, I refer to it in the paper, where the, for other reasons, the police and the Crown lost the ability of using the samples they had lawfully obtained by warrant because they, they were destroyed and they couldn't rely on the presumption. What they did was they subpoenaed everybody involved in the taking and analysis of the blood and then called that, put the evidence in that way, and then called an expert to relate the readings back. In my view, uh, for reasons I've expressed in the paper, Dirsch doesn't change the availability of that course of action to the prosecution. So basically, I would suggest that arguably on our fact scenario, the police have at least grounds to lay a drinking and driving charge. Having laid the charge, they can then subpoena the doctor, the nurses, everyone involved. They can admit the evidence by way of, uh, uh, by, in response to a subpoena. They can call an expert to relate the readings back and, in effect, avoid any uh, problems with the warrant. And so what I'd suggest is get the warrant, get the evidence, and then uh, issue the subpoenas. And on that basis, I'd say, arguably, uh, they could, uh, they could uh, succeed one way or the other. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we uh, probably have just enough time to deal with the last topic, which is the exclusion of evidence under Section 24.2. And uh, uh, for the purposes of of this topic, uh, we'll return to the fact scenario that we began with, that is the, the breathalyzer situation, and assume that the court rules that in the particular circumstances, the failure to make clear to the accused that he could retain counsel and privacy infringes his right to counsel. 
the accused at trial thereupon submits that in accordance with Regina versus Terrans, the breathalyzer results should be excluded. The question is whether or not uh, counsel's reliance on Therens is going to be sufficient to succeed on the Section 24.2 application. In, in view of the judgment of the uh, Court of Appeal in Jackson, uh, about which we've been talking a lot this morning, it's, uh, I, I don't know whether we've said this, but it was released October 25th of, of this year. Based on, on that judgment, it would appear that in Ontario, relying on on Therens as the complete argument in relation to Section 24.2 was not going to be sufficient. As you recall, Therens was an over 80 case, and uh, the Supreme Court of Canada found that the police had infringed Section 10B in the course of obtaining uh, the breathalyzer results, and they held that those results should be excluded under Section 24.2. Jackson was also an over 80 case. The Court of Appeal again found that the police had infringed Section 10B in the course of obtaining the breathalyzer results. And the circumstances of the two cases were at least to that extent analogous, but the Court of Appeal held that the evidence should not be excluded under Section 24.2. Now, some may find that result uh, surprising. After all, the, uh, the breathalyzer evidence was conscripted evidence. Uh, there was a close temporal relationship between the breach and the obtaining of the, of the evidence. Uh, since Collins, evidence of uh, that type has fairly consistently been held to impact on the fairness of the trial, and the Supreme Court of Canada has been consistent in holding that uh, uh, affecting the uh, fairness of the trial adversely will mean that the evidence should be excluded. So it's reasonable to ask how the Court of Appeal in Jackson decided that the evidence uh, should not be excluded. Justice Goodman delivered the unanimous judgment of the court, and he acknowledged that breathalyzer results were evidence that emanated from the accused that did not exist at the time of the violation. But he held that their admission into evidence would not render the trial unfair, because in his view, breathalyzer evidence is different from other types of evidence. And there's a short passage in the judgment which I'll read because it, it contains the reasoning of the court on this issue. He states, it differs from other types of evidence emanating from an accused because there is a legal obligation on a person to provide a breath sample pursuant to section 254, subsection 3A of the criminal code if the requirements of that subsection are met and it constitutes an offense for a person to fail to provide the sample without reasonable excuse. In the present case, the evidence on the voir dire clearly established reasonable and probable grounds for making the demand for a breath sample and there was no evidence to indicate a reasonable excuse which would justify the respondent failing or refusing to provide a sample no matter what advice he received from counsel. Now that's the core of the court section 24.2 analysis and in it Justice Goodman appears to have focused on two key circumstances. First, the accused was under a statutory obligation to provide the evidence and second, uh, there was nothing in the in the facts to suggest that there was any basis upon which the accused might legally have uh, elected not to provide the samples. And what the court appears to be saying is this, having regard to the circumstances revealed by the evidence, speaking to a lawyer could only have confirmed the accused's legal obligation to provide the evidence. The accused did it without the benefit of that advice and therefore it's a rational inference that he inevitably would have done so if he'd spoken to his lawyer. In other words, the evidence would have been obtained in any event. Now, implicit in that approach is the proposition that at the heart of the concept of fairness of the trial, as it pertains to the admission or exclusion of evidence under Section 24.2, is the notion that what is unfair uh, is permitting the state to incriminate an individual with evidence which might never have existed had the charter not been breached. And in Jackson, the Court of Appeal seems to be saying that there was no connection between the breach and the evidence, and therefore the fairness of Jackson's trial was not jeopardized by uh, admitting the evidence. Now, uh, there are a number of uh, things that should be said about Jackson. Uh, I know uh, that Mark has a view with respect to whether it's rightly decided, but there are also things to be said with respect to how far Jackson goes, and for uh, those issues, I'll turn
turn the matter over to Mark. All right, well, let me uh, say about how you get around Jackson, and then we'll talk about whether it was rightly decided or not. Um, um, first of all, the key, of course, to, to Jackson is that the evidence could be legally compelled. And so it does not apply to a case where the officer did not have reasonable and probable grounds, because then he, he or she was not in a position to legally compel the, the uh, evidence. It also doesn't apply to other types of evidence that you see in a breathalyzer case or a breath impaired driving case like um, sobriety tests, um, statements that the, uh, that the accused may have made in response to questioning from the officer. Um, so if you, can, if you can get that kind of, if, you, if you're dealing with that kind of evidence or that kind of situation, the lack of reasonable and probable grounds, then you can say, well, Jackson simply doesn't apply. And in, in the passage that Judge McDonnell read, you can see that in that sense it's relatively narrow. Um, now, is it rightly or wrongly decided? Well, it's hardly for us to say, right? I mean, it's a court of appeal and we're all uh, bound by it until the Supreme Court of Canada overturns them. Um, <laughs> but, but let me just say, I'm not, it's always tr troubled me these breathalyzer cases have always troubled me because I've always wondered, you know, what exactly would the, the lawyer say when he or she is called at 3 o'clock in the morning by this drunk and said, do I have to blow into the machine? It, it, you know, and we've had these great debates, you know, the, the ethical answer is, well, you have to tell them to blow, and then there's a group of people who say, no, no, you ask them all about all the circumstances, you know, did they have a reasonable excuse for refusing, and, you know, would it be worse if they blew in the machine, or the offense that they were going to get charged with. Well, having said all that, the Supreme Court of Canada in Therens, in exactly the same situation, essentially says we don't want it, we're not interested in delving into the solicitor-client relationship. I mean, they didn't say that explicitly, but surely that's the implication where you had a violation of right to counsel and the breathalyzer evidence was excluded. Boom, that's it. And I think the Ontario Court of Appeal has lost sight of several decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada where the Supreme Court has repeatedly said we are not going to decide these issues on the basis of what the lawyer might have advised the, the client. And I'll just read you one excerpt from a case called Black from the Supreme Court of Canada, which is repeated in the Elshaw case, which is extremely recent. Elshaw is referred to in the materials. And this is the reference in, from Black. In my opinion, it is improper for a court to speculate about the type of legal evidence or legal advice which would have been given had the accused actually succeeded in contacting counsel after the charge was changed. And she said, uh, Madam Justice Wilson said, such reasoning runs directly afoul of this court's judgment in Therens and Trask. And most importantly, it also totally defeats the purpose of Section 10B. And then finally, the Court of Appeal, in my view, has completely overlooked what the Supreme Court of Canada said in Collins, you know, the, the foundation case, the 24-2 case, where Justice Lemaire said, uh, in talking about the seriousness of the violation, he says, I should add that the availability of other investigatory techniques and the fact that the evidence could have been obtained without the violation of the Charter tends to render the Charter violation more serious. Well, isn't that exactly what we have here? If the police had complied with the, the Q's right to counsel, the, on the Court of Appeal's own reasoning, they would have then ob obtained the evidence. Well, that just makes the violation more serious, not less serious, not more likely to get, to get admitted, not, less, not more likely to render the trial less unfair. So obviously that's not an issue that's open in Ontario to the Supreme Court of Canada re-examines re the issue. Thank you, Mark. We're uh, out of time, but just before uh, we close. I want to mention that uh, there is uh, some material from Alan Gold that's included in this part of, uh, of the material. It's a part that's referable to this uh, program. Um, and I just want to publicly thank Alan, who's not here. Uh, Alan provided that material after he already knew that he wasn't going to be on the panel. It was very good of him to do so and uh, completely in keeping with uh, what we all know about Alan's willingness to, to help. Thank you very much. The next panel is on um, civil and insurance consequences of drinking and driving convictions. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Grant Dow, who's with the uh, firm of Gilbert Wright and Flaherty. 
Grant has been with us on uh, previous occasions. He's a partner in that firm which specializes in personal injury and insurance litigation in Toronto. Uh, and um, he has brought along uh, with him Michael Sobey, who is a casualty claims manager with Allstate. Allstate has been very generous uh, over the years in, in providing representation uh, to accompany uh, uh, Grant and, and uh, uh, from, um, from uh, Gilbert Wright and Flaherty. Uh, I think you'll, um, uh, you'll notice that, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Sobey is uh, well qualified to, uh, to assist you in your in inquiries. Uh, he's, uh, as I indicated, a casualty claims manager. Uh, and has been employed with Allstate for 15 years in various fields, although it says he has responsibility for overall office severity and quality controls. It really should be authority and quality controls. Um, and um, I, I think you'll agree with me that this particular part of the program uh, is, uh, is extremely valuable, valuable in terms of Defense Council's ability in giving the total practical advice uh, to, uh, to the client when the client uh, comes in the door uh, and, and provides you with the background of uh, what civil consequences uh, may ensue from, uh, part from convictions uh, for particular offenses uh, and uh, related matters. Uh, there will be a, a coffee break at the conclusion of this panel and uh, uh, with that uh, I turn it over to Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as he's indicated, I've been asked to review the insurance consequences of persons charged uh, with or convicted of alcohol-related criminal code offenses involving motor vehicles. Uh, Mike Sobey from Allstate is here for some practical points that uh, would involve the effect of those offenses or convictions on premiums, the nature of the investigation that insurers conduct, and the expected cooperation uh, they have from the accused or the, from their perspective the insured. The two principal sources of automobile insurance law in Ontario are first sections 224 to 289 of the Insurance Act, and that's RSO 1990, and the Ontario Automobile Policy, uh, OPF1 Owner's Policy, uh, that is in existence at present. This was substantially changed in June of 1990, and there are further changes that are expected to take effect January 1, 1994. And for that reason, uh, we don't have all of those changes. I apologize for there not being a paper. I was hoping to get some of them. Uh, they're still not out, and we're still not certain if indeed January 1, 94 is the date, although the minister says he's using that date. Uh, we're now beginning to see the full impact of the uh, no-fault auto insurance, which has been in effect since June of 1990. Uh, witness the Meyer and Bright uh, the trilogy, the Court of Appeal decision, the reasons were released. October 23rd of 1993, and I expect them to be reported uh, in the various uh, reporting services shortly. Uh, to the extent I was able to figure it out, I don't expect any significant changes under what is called Bill 164 with regard to the areas that I cover, and I'll try and separate those if I think there is any change. But the fact remains that personal injury uh, claims continue to be divided into two categories. Uh, those are that are above what is a verbal threshold and that will continue to deal with only serious or permanent injuries. And now the actions are as of January 194, the actions will be restricted to non-economic loss and subject to a $10,000 deductible. And those uh, injuries which are below that verbal threshold where the only recourse a person has is against their own insurer for what was called uh, accident benefits and is now going to be called a statutory accident benefit schedule. And no doubt the acronym SABS is going to be applied. Uh, for the property damage claims, we continue to will continue to be dealing with the person's own insurer, and the insurer that insurer has no recourse against the insurer of the at fault driver. Uh, the Insurance Act uh, provides for this all to be regulated through the Ontario Insurance Commission. We're seeing them getting involved more and more with uh, what we do, and uh, the other part of it is, as I've indicated, is the standard policy. That's something the public really never sees. What the public sees is the pink card that's issued to them. Uh, and that's what the police want to see when they stop someone. And the other uh, document is, is the certificate of insurance that is set out, set, sent out to each of you or, or to your clients each year that tells you not only how much it's going to cost for car insurance for that year, but describes the various coverages and the separate costs of each of those. Uh, 
The standard policy now has six parts, and I understand that's unlikely to change, parts A through F, and there are five optional endorsements. Uh, there's only four portions that relate to this topic. Part A, which provides for the insurer's obligation to pay the damages caused by uh, or to an injured person uh, where that injured person has injuries that exceed the threshold. Part B, which is the available no-fault benefit, soon to be called statutory accident benefits. Part C, which are the rules that uh, require or uh, permit an insurer to pay or not pay to fix your client or the accused vehicle. And Part F, which is the statutory conditions. And they set out the individual's obligation to cooperate with the insurer as well as uh, the prohibited uses of the vehicle. I propose to go through the various, or go through the insurance factors, and I'm going to make some assumptions. Uh, the word client, the word accused, and the word insured can be used almost interchangeably. Uh, they're your client, they're Mr. Sobey's insured, and uh, they're my insured uh, as well. I'm going to presume that uh, the person who's been charged with one of the three usual uh, offenses, over 80, impaired, or refused to blow, that he's been in an accident with another vehicle, that there's been damage to both vehicles, that uh, the accused is injured, he has OHIP coverage, perhaps as well coverage with an employer or a personal accident or sickness plan, and that some other person has been injured in the accident, and that person is claiming to be injured and has notified the accused that he'll be seeking damages. Dealing first with Part A, that applies uh, to whether the insurer will pay the damages uh, to the other person in those circumstances. The short answer is yes. Uh, assuming that those injuries exceed the threshold, uh, the insurer cannot seek reimbursement uh, from their insured with the following exceptions. First, if there's been a breach of the statutory condition, such as driving while not authorized to do so, or they've been in a race or a speed test or involved in some illicit trade, in those cases, the insurer will pay only minimum limits uh, imposed by the Insurance Act, which uh, at present are $200,000 plus uh, legal costs. Uh, the concern here is if the injured person has injuries which uh, exceed this new threshold. That new threshold is uh, going to be the person uh, that was injured is either dead or, to quote, serious disfigurement or serious impairment of an important physical, mental, or psychological function. Uh, the fact is, without economic loss being included, uh, there is the, uh, the trilo what's known as the trilogy, the Tino and Arnold uh, cases in 1978, the Supreme Court of Canada, which set a limit of $100,000 in 1978 dollars. Uh, that's now, as of October of 93, worth $245,100. But the concern here, or the ex expectation might be that that is probably, oh, $200,000, having that only that coverage would only be a concern where there's multiple claimants or perhaps catastrophic injuries, although we're certainly in, uh, expecting someone to take a run at that trilogy given the whole uh, basis has changed and whether or not it ought to apply. Uh, the other scenario in that uh, involves uh, what's called SCF 44 or family protection endorsements, which would result in the injured person's own insurer paying the excess However, they get the right then to collect it from the uh, impaired driver or the at-fault person. Uh, the next exception is if the nature of the act is outside those usual three offenses, such that the conduct could be considered a deliberate attempt to injure. Uh, in those cases, the insurance company is still required to pay the money to the injured person, but they can then seek reimbursement from the person who uh, did the deliberate act. Uh, and I've had three examples of this to give you a straightforward one is in a call in a case, uh, Iaquone versus Constitution Insurance. In that case, uh, a husband found out that his wife's driving instructor were, was uh, doing much more than teaching her how to drive. He, he waited for the fellow in a parking lot, and when he had the chance, he ran him over. Uh, in, in that case, obviously, the insurer had to pay, and they were able to seek reimbursement from the person that uh, the husband. Uh, the more interesting case we're seeing is where the impaired driver is uh, spotted by the police, uh, or more importantly, the uh, impaired driver spots the police and attempts to elude them. There is a police chase, and the drunk driver will then hit uh, innocent property or persons. Uh, there is a case called Wawanisa Insurance and in Thomas. It's a Nova Scotia Court of Appeal case where the judge found that uh, that was sufficient to deny the uh, insured's right to be indemnified by his insurer, and the insurer could seek reimbursement. Uh, there's another case I found recently in British Columbia where there's some contrary thinking to that, uh, but I, the bottom line is I think it should raise concern 
amongst uh, criminal lawyers, defense lawyers, uh, when they make a plea bargain to consider guilty pleas to convictions such as racing or uh, any offense where the definition of the offense would be that there's been a, an act which could be conceived as or perceived as deliberate. Part B of the policy, the statutory accident benefits person, assuming uh, this is where the injuries are uh, less than the threshold and would also apply if there uh, exceeds the threshold. Uh, you'll recall I suggested that the person is off work and he has medical bills, presumably. If he's still out of pocket after OHIP uh, pays their share and he has his own employer plan, which is uh, the next level of uh, insurance he would have to uh, cover those medical bills, the uh, drunk driver is still entitled to legitimate medical or rehabilitation expenses. In fact, they're quite wide-ranging. They're uh, continuing to be revolved and being sorted out by the Ontario Insurance Commission. They will include things uh, such as life skill occup and occupational training, home renovations, non-medical services that are required, uh, visits from immediate family or siblings. Uh, the bad news is there's a wide prohibition against payment of any benefit for loss of income. Uh, under the current scheme, it's 80% of a gross uh, salary or income to a maximum that can range from 600 to 1,050 a week. The new scheme will deal with 90% of a net income to a maximum of $1,000 per week. The test is set out in the Clause uh, 2.40 of Part B, and it includes convictions for impaired driving, blowing over, an indictable offense related to the operation of a motor vehicle, refusing to blow, driving without insurance, uh, not authorized to drive or by law to drive, and that means your license is suspended at the time for reasons other than unpaid fines, uh, as well an excluded driver, that's someone who's been specifically listed on the policy. Uh, known to live or associate with the principal driver that has a bad driving record and uh, the policyholder promises that that person won't drive the vehicle and uh, driving or an occupant of a vehicle that the known driver does not have consent to use or operate the vehicle. The only loophole in all of that appears to be the indictable offense uh, part of it. Uh, you might want to consider proposing a guilty plea to the Crown Attorney uh, in agreement for using a, perhaps a summary conviction offense and not one of the usual three uh, offenses. Um, part C is the what we know perhaps better as collision coverage. This and uh, premium increases remain the real penalty to the drinking and driving uh, uh, or impaired driver where there is not a serious injury. The insurer will not pay to fix the vehicle. It's specifically excluded uh, where there's this uh, uh, this occurs. There's three parts to the test. The first part is where the insured or the accused is under the influence of intoxicating substances to such an extent as to be incapable of proper control of the automobile. The second part is the convictions for uh, criminal negligence causing death, criminal negligence causing bodily harm, dangerous driving, fail to stop at the scene of an accident, impaired, over 80, refusing to blow, bodily harm during the operation of a vehicle while impaired or over 80, driving while suspended. As well, the third part is then goes on to say that any similar law in Ontario, another jurisdiction in Canada, or the United States will also, could also be included. Uh, the points I wanted to cover here is that the insurer will rely on the conviction, but obviously that doesn't happen right away. Uh, my experience or our experience is that the insurer will maybe go out and appraise the vehicle, but then will refuse to repair it pending the hearing of the charges. Uh, the insured is then left to bear those costs of repairing it, storing it, uh, the lease payments. At best, the, you may get the insurer to pay to fix the car, but there will then be a demand, and I understand from Mr. Sobey, they've done it successfully, to get the money back, and that may include a lawsuit. Um, the second basis for refusing to pay uh, the collision coverage is where someone is incapable of the proper control of the automobile. Uh, this is used where the person has been acquitted uh, of any one of those offenses, no doubt due to some of the things you're learning about today. Um, the evolution of those cases uh, of what constitutes incapable of proper control seems to have leveled off. Uh, it certainly reflects the greater public and judicial awareness and disapproval of drinking and driving. Uh, for example, in 1973, there's a decision that the blood alcohol equivalent of 220 milligrams uh, in a person, they were found to still be capable of controlling an automobile. To 1984, 
where someone with 120 milligrams uh, was found incapable to uh, a 1990 case uh, where there were uh, police officers' observations only without a breathalyzer or a blood reading. Uh, there was no uh, charge laid. Uh, it was the obvious evidence of being unsteady on the, on the feet, smelling of alcohol and slurred speech. The court found that was sufficient to find that the person was incapable of the proper control of the vehicle. Uh, that case, interestingly, was uh, called McGregor versus uh, the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia. Uh, I went to update this, and the only other case I found which was similar is also called McGregor versus Insurance Corporation of British Columbia. I hope it wasn't the same fellow. That's a 1993 case. Um, the last uh, part F, the statutory conditions. Uh, in the late 1980s, there were situations that arose where the accused was charged with criminal negligence, and the Crown Attorney's Office began to take a greater interest in what was in the insurance company files. Uh, in reality, in serious accidents, or uh, one or more insurer that's involved in that will conduct their own investigation that uh, often parallels that of the police and will often involve some cooperation as far as exchanging photographs and uh, uh, examining the vehicle and that sort of thing. Uh, the insurers have a real advantage here because their contract, their policy, obliges their insured to cooperate with them in the investigation of that accident. And that involves and routinely involves giving a signed statement which will detail the events of when the drinking began, how many drinks were involved, what brand, who or she, uh, they were, who, who they were with, and that compares obviously with the charter right of an accused to say nothing to the police. Our firm has been involved in a number of applications to set aside summons served on an insurance adjuster or, or an, to quash search warrants on an insurer, insurance company. Uh, in the result, uh, the court has protected a privilege that has been claimed by the insurer for these documents. They feel in an awkward position to have this information uh, about an insured that the uh, Crown Attorney is seeking. They don't feel they should be giving up. Uh, there's also been instances uh, that I've been involved in where the Crown Attorney has agreed not to call that evidence. Um, there's three decisions really that deal with it. Uh, the, one of them is a Court of Appeal decision. It's called Regina and Logan. And it eroded the principle, if I could use that uh, word to the extent that it refers it back to the trial judge to make the actual decision. Uh, that was the, the genesis of, of this law. It was Regina and Westmoreland. That was uh, a case that I was involved in, and uh, I indeed argued it before the trial judge, in this case, uh, Mr. Justice Steele. It was in Brampton. Uh, I delivered the file in a sealed condition to the Crown Attorney uh, with the motion to quash the, uh, the search warrant and uh, set aside the subpoena. I succeeded in persuading the, uh, the Crown Attorney to argue the point without first opening the material or charging me with obstructing justice, which was raised in the discussion. Uh, the end result is I would take some care in letting an accused give a statement where there hasn't been, a, for example, a letter from the injured person's lawyer that, uh, in my view, would crystallize the claim uh, for the privilege. Um, I have been involved in uh, situations where the, uh, one of you people have refused to let your client as an accused give that statement, and the, what we've worked out is that um, I have written a letter to that, uh, been, to that uh, defense counsel saying, look, I've been retained, we're expecting a claim, we're anticipating a claim, I want this investigation conducted, and in anticipation of litigation, I want this insurance adjuster to take a statement from this insured, and we've never had any uh, uh, problems with that. Uh, the key is to fit within the chronology of the events that Mr. Justice Steele set out in Regina and Westmoreland. The third case that uh, was involved, I wasn't involved in, is called Regina and Morrow. Um, in this case, it was the accused looking for witness statements that the insurance company may or may not had, have. The judge ruled they were entitled to that material, and that decision was appealed. It never proceeded. I spoke with the counsel that was involved, and uh, it was explained to me that it was a situation where the defense uh, counsel just couldn't be persuaded of what was in the file and the fact there were some things that in a civil lawsuit he wouldn't be entitled to see. Uh, there are things that you can expect at some time the insured will sue the insurer for accident benefits and all and things that the insurer refuses to pay and uh, that was the basis for the disagreement. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, let Michael speak to you, and if you've got any questions or you wanted any citations, I'm sure we can do it at the end, or I'll stay during the break, but I understand it's happening after. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm pleased to be here today, and I hope I can give you a little bit of insight into the practical areas that your client may be facing. Um, in a nutshell, 
is you're probably going to get somebody walking your door and they're going to be scared. Um, the financial implications of what occurred uh, are going to be severe and they have the potential to be devastating. Uh, first and foremost is the uh, difficulty that we, we uh, or the co primary concern that you're going to be addressed is with the vehicle itself. <clears throat> I, as Grant has mentioned, is that uh, generally the insurance company will not pay if, the, uh, if your client has been charged and anything that you can do to help him mitigate this area, getting it out of a storage yard, uh, putting it in his driveway, whatever, is going to help. Um, in the event, usually we, we make the point of appraising the vehicle as quickly as possible. Even if the vehicle is a total loss, we have a value that we're ready to settle with your client in the event that your success of the charge is successful. Um, in addition to that factor is the uh, client has the concern with respect to his sentencing or fined. If, uh, as Grant has mentioned, if he's disabled and unable to work, he may be suffering from a loss of income. All these things combined can be quite devastating to him. And we haven't even talked about your fees yet. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, one can make the argument that your fees are an investment in these circumstances as opposed to being an expense. Um, if you're successful, um, we will be paying for his loss of income. We will be paying for his vehicle. And um, t to me, that seems to be a, a quite a, a positive uh, aspect of you being involved in the case. A secondary issue that he's going to have to deal with later with respect to the conviction is the increase in automobile insurance premiums. Uh, these, of course, will come into play if the individual is convicted or pleads guilty to any of these charges and um, once again can be very, very significant. Uh, I'll give you a specific example of an individual, a 35-year-old male uh, living in Hamilton who owns a, a new vehicle, a 1993 uh, Chrysler Concord. Um, this individual has been licensed for 15 years and travels approximately 15 kilometers to and from work. He has had no traffic tickets over the past three years, no criminal code driving convictions, or motor vehicle accidents in the last six years. His yearly premium <clears throat> prior to any incident for a million dollars worth of liability coverage, collision coverage with a $250 deductible, and comprehensive coverage with a $100 deductible would be approximately $1,300 per year. <clears throat> if this individual is convicted of an impaired or one of the other offenses that we're here discussing today, he would be likely quoted a facility rate and his yearly premium would escalate to approximately $3,600 per year. If an accident for which he's at fault is involved, that rate will go to $5,400 per year. If this is a second conviction with no accident, within three years of the first, he is looking at a premium of approximately $5,700 and this is without any motor vehicle accidents. Um, the other aspect with respect to this, and I mentioned the facility association, and I'd like to explain this a little bit to you. Um, it's not something that you'll deal with directly, but it's a type of reinsurance pool. It's, it's basically once your client gets into this, they're in essence labeled as a bad risk. Um, once you're in the facility pool, what this is, is a, a pool of all the insurers that write business in Ontario and what they are doing is sharing the risk is generally uh, statistically speaking is what we have found is that the risk for these people once they are involved in one offense is so substantial that the risk should be shared and um, once again is that's why these premiums are so extremely high there has been a recent innovation where we're trying the insurance industry is trying to depopulate uh, this pool um, and they've They've created something called a gray pool, which is a transitionary type of, uh, uh, of a pool of business where once a person has indicated some good driving behavior for a period of approximately two to three years, then they go into this gray pool, which is a, uh, tries to get them back into a regular book of business with the uh, substantially reduced rates back to the $1,300 level. Um, Basically, because the insurance, automobile insurance is compulsory in Ontario, your client really will not have any choice. And if he's also facing uh, a loss of income, 
from a monthly premium of approximately $100 or $110 to go to a monthly premium of approximately four to 500 can also be devastating not only on your client but also his family. He also has no choice because if he is uh, convicted of not operating or not having uh, automobile insurance while operating a vehicle, then once again, severe penalties uh, come into play. Um, it has been our experience that uh, alcohol and severe automobile accidents tend to go hand in hand. In the event that your client has insufficient liability limits to respond to the claims presented, then he has the potential of being um, the potential of being forced to reimburse his insurer for the amounts that they've had to pay on his behalf over and above his limit. Uh, Grant mentioned this, and this has, of course, been somewhat restricted by the recent changes in our uh, insurance legislation here in Ontario. But the fact remains is any severe injury is going to exceed both of the thresholds that we have been dealing with. In, in these cases, it, it's crucial that we get out and talk to your client as early as possible, subject to the covenant that Grant has mentioned. As usually in these incidences, we are placed on notice of the claims against uh, your client extremely early on, simply due to their severe nature. This being the case, as we try to, to conduct as thorough an investigation as we can to defend him on the civil case that usually tends to follow. Um, this investigation would include uh, meeting with your client and taking a very detailed statement from him, um, trying to do the same thing with anybody else that is involved in the accident, usually meeting and interviewing the investigating officer and any other independent witnesses to the accident. <coughs> Generally speaking, we try to be as cooperative as possible to you, and that includes providing you with a copy of the statement that we take from your client. <clears throat> we also uh, will uh, go to the scene of the accident, take photographs and diagrams of the scene. Usually we um, also take photographs, extensive photographs of the vehicles involved in the accident as well. In the particularly severe cases, or <clears throat> cases that are, in, uh, are not straightforward, we may also retain an accident reconstruction expert or an engineer for a further expert opinion. Although all this information cannot necessarily be disclosed to you in its entirety, we certainly try to be as helpful as possible and may give you uh, some insights which help you defend your client. Um, we also may uncover in our investigations the fact that the liability or responsibility for the accident may be shared with a tavern or social host. Um, this may provide your client with an opportunity to pursue a claim, an injury claim on their own behalf. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, uh, or during the last five years, the number of suits of this type has risen sharply in Ontario, and uh, it may provide some relief to your client. Your The fact that we're able to uh, interview and speak with your client may also help to reduce the claims that are being presented by the passenger in passengers in his vehicle as they have may have been contributory negligence or in, in extreme circumstances as those claims may be denied in their entirety due to a Valenti defense. Um, it has been our experience that the longer we wait or the longer this type of investigation is delayed is the less accurate and the less chance of, that we have of successfully defending your client. Um, any assistance that we can uh, help you with, and in turn, if we can help uh, respond to that, would be greatly appreciated. Um, if uh, there's any other information that you would like to ask, either Grant or myself, I'd be happy to uh, provide you with whatever help we can. I understand I have to repeat the questions. Because um, actually, we're running a little late, so, so I think what we'll do is let them ask. Uh, yeah, we're going to take a break now. Um, if you want uh, the panel to be available, I'd like to thank them very much. <laughs> and um, um, maybe they'll stay here for the first sure. few minutes, and uh, if there are any questions, and maybe bring your coffee back in. <laughs>